So let me just say that and bring on Dr. David Martin without further ado. So going last, before a now deferred meal, is always a challenge because you're always fighting with whatever is going on inside and you have to overcome that and somehow make sure that you're sating a per particular part of, of the uh, intellect so that whatever the grumblings are down here actually don't drown out what's going on up here. So I decided that the place we ought to start is why I didn't want to come to this conference. Because you should start with your objections. If you start with your objections, people actually understand a bit more of why you're standing here and, and what it was that actually wound up putting you here. And I want to start by saying that if you take nothing else away from my presentation today, I hope you take away one gift I'm asking of you. And that gift is never to use the word free again. Never use the word free again. Free isn't. Free isn't. Free is a proxy for our calcification of our consciousness that fails to articulate the contributions that are actually contributing unseen to what we all are. There is no free. There is, in fact, synthesis, there is integration, there is accountability, but there is no free. And the illusion of free, which was born, oddly enough, in the 13th century as a cover story for the manipulation of everything from religion to politics to economics, continues to be the fulcrum around which battles are fought and ultimately lost. We should embrace the grand expense of the privilege of our life. The expense that starts with the mystery of how we show up. The expense that starts with the air that we first breathe. The expense of that beautiful gift called the synthesis of our being none of which was free. It all came at a cost. And the minute we forget a single moment of any of those costs, we start building the cancer of the illusion that ultimately serves to enslave us. How do we move from a quantum space that has been persistently enslaved from Edison through Einstein and move into a space where everyone actually understands themselves, not as a consumer and a producer, but as an integrated whole in a system which actually builds what I like to refer to as our common wealth. Now, why didn't I, why didn't I want to come here? I didn't want to come here because you know what I'm sick of? I'm sick of people talking about free energy. And I'm sick and tired of people talking about free energy for a very simple reason. Beyond the fact that it's not free, and it never will be free, because I don't think any of us are in the business right now of actually having the audacity of saying that we were around for gravity, we were around for magnetism, we were around for water, we were around for Toyota fields, we were around for all of these things. We weren't. But what we need to do is understand that by believing in a world where we have to argue for the emancipation of electricity, we're passing over our own slavery. We're saying, take the manacles off my wrists, but leave them on my ankles. What do I mean? Well, what I mean is the following. We burn fossil fuels, we enrich and decay uranium, we do all sorts of things to allegedly harvest and harness power, which we then do the exact opposite of, where we push through resistive coils we try to create magnetic fields. We try to do all of those things to achieve what? The moral imperative of humanity. We have to light, we have to cool, we have to heat, we have to communicate, 
and we have to transport. And inconveniently, prior to Edison, we didn't do any of these things, right? We, we didn't have economies, right? We, we, we had no utilities, right? We didn't have any of those things, right? None of those existed before we had 60 hertz, right? Nonsense. Nonsense. Why don't we have as many electricless refrigerators out there? Why don't we have as many electricless data storage systems out there? Why don't you have my algae data storage, which I created through a linguistic genomics exercise we did back in the 1980s and early 1990s, which actually had a petabyte of storage which could self-replicate in algae with no external power source other than the sun. Why don't we have that? Oh, we don't have that because this is what we actually like. We like a world that runs at 188.6% negative efficiency so that we can plug something into a freaking wall socket. Let's review. We dig a hole in the ground, and that hole in the ground actually runs after we've dug the hole at an 8% inefficiency. We actually lose 8% efficiency merely by the fluid dynamics of a pump, and that's a pump fully operational. So we lose 8% of our energy just to get the damn stuff out of the ground, and then we refine it. The best refiners in the world have an 86.4% efficiency, which means now we're up to minus 21.6. And then we haul it. We haul it with ships, and we haul it with trucks, and we haul it with rail, and we haul it with all kinds of other things. Now we're at minus 34.6% efficiency, and then we decide to burn it. Screw the earth, screw the environment, screw the air, screw future generations. We burn it to do what? Boil water which gives us, at best, a cogeneration efficiency of 43%. We are now at 91.6% inefficient, and then we decide to push it into copper high tension lines. Oh, that's real brilliant, isn't it? Yeah, I got an idea. Let's take 60 hertz that we got from burning something, let's put it into DC transmission lines, let's shove it across our landscape, and oh, by the way, lose another 7% if we only have a kilometer to go, and if we have more than that to go, we're really effed. Because if we have to go more than a kilometer, that drops off. So guess what? In the best of worlds where you live right next to the power plant, the best of worlds, you live right next to the power plant, your luckiest day, you're now at minus 98.6% efficient. And by the way, it's not even in your home yet because then you put it in to your freaking utility substation, which on the best of days operates, giving you a 60% utility efficiency, and then you put it in your refrigerator to actually get 188.6% loss of energy, and that, by the way, is an unconsidered cost by anybody who talks about free energy. Why do I want to be a part of this grid? Why? Even if I'm free, I have to overgenerate 200% just so I can have a cold Coke made with hydrogenated God knows what and corn syrup and God knows what else Monsanto's trying to poison me with so I can die faster, but man, does it taste good. That's what we want? That, by the way, is the reason why I didn't want to come here. Nonsense about free energy. Pick the right fight. Pick the right fight. Guess who controls the not free energy? Oddly enough, people who actually are making money on what you see right here. By the way, you were supposed to hear about politics. You are hearing about politics. This is the reason why the political system that you call the politi political system actually is. The political system that we have is not politics. It is a corporate cover-up funded by billions of dollars and billions of euros of people who want you to believe that this is the best we can do. 
Obama is as corrupt as Romney. And by the way, I can go across every part of the Greens and the EFAs and the pirate parties and the Christian Democrats and the Communist Democrats and the God knows how many other Democrats you have in the EU. I can go across all of them and they're all drinking this Kool-Aid and they're serving it to you out of your refrigerators that are running at a minus 188.6 efficiency. And nobody is talking about it. That pisses me off. Oh, I am nobody officially. Here's why. Let me tell you something. 60 hertz. What is it about 60 hertz that's such a damn fine, like heroin or opium or whatever it is that we like to get a hit on? What is it about 60 hertz? Why is it 60 hertz? Yeah, it actually does. I did functional MRI studies in 19, 1989, 1990, and 1991. You know what we found out? The more you're exposed with fMRI to 60 hertz, the more you actually have suppression of neurologic function. You know why some people actually have a hard time walking into a Walmart? Because their brain actually hurts. You know why a lot of people still walk into Walmarts? Because they've been anesthetized. 60 hertz is a phenomenal frequency. Because if you get over it hurting, you get numb. And when you get numb, you can get anything sold to you. Like a damn smiley face that somebody puts on your jacket. Or a damn smiley face that somebody puts on your shirt when you walk into a store where you're going to buy shit that you don't need. But you're going to be happy about it because somebody put a smiley face on your shirt. It's a hypnosis, people. It's a hypnosis. You have to break the hypnosis. If you actually want to understand politics, you want to understand the economics, you have to understand that you are hypnotized, and you are hypnotized by something that happens to work. And, lo and behold, it doesn't just work in a little bit of a way. It works in a really big way. But we could all say, well, you know what? I don't know what the problem is because, after all, I'm actually tweeting about free energy on my iPad that's connected to my battery that I got, a lithium battery that's the extended life battery, and it, it's all running on this great thing called copper. And let me tell you a little bit about copper. Copper actually was an accident. If you go back in history, go back 3,000 years, copper was actually used from time to time. It was primarily used, by the way, for its antimicrobial properties. Very early on, the reason why uh, Ayurvedic cultures, a lot of other cultures use copper, a lot of the Mesopotamian cultures use copper, a lot of them use copper as a way to sterilize water before they drank it. It's actually a really good thing, because that little bit of copper oxide that happens when you put copper in the exposure of the water that you're about to drink actually kills off a lot of bacteria. It's actually a pretty good thing for public health. That's the reason why people use copper. But then a gold miner with the last name of Kennecott actually failed in a gold mine in Utah. I don't know how many of you actually know the story of the gold rush in California, which is supposed to be the cover story of why Silicon Valley became great and why the West Coast is great and why California is such a great mecca of all great ideas and all that kind of nonsense. Interesting cover story. Kennecott, the actual miner that went to California and then tried to expand out into the other parts of the West Coast of the United States to be a gold miner, actually failed. He couldn't find gold. But he went back to Utah, and in Utah he found a very interesting deposit of copper. He started mining copper, and you know what happened about the same time he started mining copper? A thing called the Transatlantic or Transcontinental Railroad. The Transcontinental Railroad actually, to be bribed, and by the, by the way, I'm saying bribed because it actually was a bribe, to build the, to build the Transcontinental Railroad, Leland Stanford and a no number of others actually got together and petitioned Congress to give them land alongside the railroad. And the harder it was to lay track, the more land they got. It's the largest land grab, private sector land grab in U.S. history. And interestingly enough, they decided that right next to the railroad tracks, they would hang what they called the grapevine. You know what the grapevine was? First transcontinental telegraph line. 
you know how much copper was worth before that started? It was worthless. It was a lost operation. You know the longest continuously operating mine in the United States? Kennecott Copper Mine. You know the company that is the current owner of Kennecott Copper Mine? Rio Tinto. You know how many of your pension funds here in Europe and you know how many pension funds in the United States have invested in Rio Tinto? All of them. Guess why you don't ever hear this story? Because of what I'm about to tell you. The reason why we have a 60 hertz addiction is because right now we've actually inextricably linked all of our annuities and our pensions to copper mining. And then we came up with this really great idea in the 1950s and 1960s to actually make sure that all of our public utilities and all our municipalities actually were funded by long duration bonds. You know what those bonds were? Those were debt instruments. Those debt instruments are the principal instruments that are purchased by people who have to have long fiduciary investments. And those long fiduciary investments are what props up everybody's retirement account. So if you actually ever took the lines down, you'd have to take money from mom and dad, grandpa and grandma. You'd have to take money out from under the pensions. Guess how much of an appetite is for that? How many people would love to see their asset value drop to at least 40% of its present value instantaneously if you ever dropped the utility fee from running the revenue bonds off of that public utility infrastructure. Nobody's ready to take that pill. You think austerity in Greece is bad? Austerity in the United States happens when we actually see Starbucks raise their coffee prices 30 cents. That's, what our, that's our definition of austerity. Right, if we actually saw our pension values drop by 40%, We'd go nuts. We'd have civil war. And guess what? The system knows that. That's why free energy is encouraged to try to fit into a grid. But guess what? If you feed the grid, guess what you've done? Kept the heroin going. Kept the heroin going. It also is supported through commodity speculation. One of the greatest places to make money, particularly now in quantitative trading strategies, is actually to trade on commodities and metal commodities, particularly commodities that go into the consumer electronics that we all seem to love, actually are phenomenal places for commodity speculation because you can actually do all kinds of currency and commodity value manipulation by spot trading. And it turns out that's a very lucrative trade. Once again, I would say that if you have a pension or if you are covered by a government pension or if you have any part of a health care program anywhere in Europe or anywhere in the United States, you're actually participating. Uh-oh. Feels like we're all participating. Colonial conflict and war. You know, the cool thing about colonial conflict and war is we actually don't have to think about it because it happens in remote places. One of the great things about genocide is if it doesn't happen in your backyard, it doesn't really happen. It's amazing. We just think that it's somebody else's problem. And since we never really knew that somebody else, Whose problem really is it? Right? If our ringtones of all of our cell phones came with the screams of raped women who are being raped by their 14-year-old sons in conflict metal areas, how many of us would love to have our ringtone go off in a public meeting? Not a single one of us would do that. But you know why you don't hear those cries? You know why you don't hear them? Because you've decided to tune them out, not because they don't happen. So what else have we done? We've decided to surrogate. We justify all this because what we do with the technology is obviously superior. We never for a moment stop and ask, at what price? And in a second? I'm going to show you the price. This is Bougainville Copper. I want you to pause for a minute because I need the picture to speak for a moment. I want you to meet somebody. The person I want you to meet is a gentleman who's holding my hand. That gentleman and that particular picture on that particular day is the first time 
an individual who's been classified by the United States and by Europe as a warlord, ever was seen touching a person of Caucasian descent without killing them. That's the first person. And I'd like you to actually know that and then read the quote that was posthumously written in honor of Thomas Edison. And I'd like you to just juxtapose those in your head for a minute. I don't want to read it. I want you to read it. And then I want you to ask yourself, every time you go to the refrigerator, and you know that refrigerator is powered by a compressor coil, and that compressor coil is comprised of a whole bunch of wound copper. I want you to ask yourself, whatever you took out of the refrigerator, was it actually worth 20,000 lives that were killed in a civil war in 1989 that none of you saw on the front pages of your papers? Because after all, this was an island in the Pacific. Most anthropologists would say it only had been inhabited for 40,000 years of continuous habitation. Only 40,000 years. Civilization, only 40,000 years of continuous habitation. Where 50% of the island's population was killed in 12 months. Funded by your pensions. See, when you put it that way, it stops feeling like free energy is the problem. It starts feeling like we've actually been deluded to believe that that's the problem to distract us from what the problem is. The problem is our belief that somehow or another we can morally justify that this copper here, which by the way, has a funny story. I actually said to the guys who were defending the warlord, that warlord that was so scary, I said to him, you know what would be a great picture? Would be if you unloaded your clips and let me photograph your bullets with hibiscus flowers. By the way, the most beautiful picture of copper ever out of Bougainville is this picture right here. That is magic. And that's not theoretical magic, by the way. That's actual magic. When you start 30 minutes earlier with an AK-47 gun barrel in your chest, being told you're going to die, and you realize that the power of truth and the power of conviction actually melts the iron of a gun barrel, so much so that 30 minutes later, the bullets that were in the clip are now not pointed at you, but they're actually out of the clip, and they're sitting next to hibiscus flowers, that, ladies and gentlemen, is the power that we're looking for. That's the power we're looking for. And guess what happened when I actually shot a video, which you can get off of my blog, Inverted Alchemy, and the name Inverted Alchemy is not by accident. Inverted Alchemy is a gift to me from a four-year-old girl who visited me in a dream wearing white. And that four-year-old girl actually showed me through all of time every alchemist and everything that every alchemist had tried to do, how to transform something into something of greater value. And the four-year-old girl in my dream asked me at the end of my dream, when are we going to start turning gold back into humanity? Don't tell me about free energy. Don't tell me about politics. Don't tell me about economies. Ask that four-year-old girl's question and then find out where you're answering it. Because it turns out that along that pathway you find some really interesting things. It turns out when you stop seeing yourself as merely the victim of a system where the debt occur, cu currencies are just too big to take on 
and where the imperial structures that we've lived with are just too big to take on. And when all of these things are so overwhelming that it's just easier for me to come to a conference and check the box and say, at least I came, at least I thought about this for a weekend. When I get past that, I actually realize that I'm not unempowered at all. I'm unplugged. And you know what's funny when you're unplugged? You can actually walk into a gun barrel and the gun barrel actually melts when it comes in contact with your chest. Do you know why? Because a gun barrel works to intimidate. But when it stops working to intimidate, it becomes powerless. Because guess what you can't take? You can't take something that's not yours to give. How many times did I hear from Rio Tinto shareholders, you should fear for your life? Interesting proposition, because I don't accept your opening premise. I hope that wasn't too complicated for some of you to get. You can't take what I don't have to give. I didn't make it. I'm just a freaking bunch of standing waves happening to stand in front of you in a little town outside of Amsterdam right now. I'm this bizarre compilation of energy and particles that happen to be holographically manifesting in front of you on this stage right now, and I happen to have a lot of passion that comes with it and blame some cosmic force for that, but guess what? You can't take what I can't give. And the minute every one of you who actually heard Chris, uh, Catherine Austin Fitz who gave a phenomenal presentation earlier today, the minute some of you realize that it is your transparency about your own mythology of your own separation and your own isolation, which is the reason why you can't contemplate a financial system with full transparency. Oh, hold on a second, Dave. You're saying that we might bear responsibility? Yes. And not only do we have responsibility, we have accountability which means we actually have to answer for how we show up. And the minute we actually embrace that, we start going, well, hold on a second, where's the victim here? And guess what? There isn't one. There isn't one. The victim is only created in economics, in politics, and in corporate global global dynamics of how trade works and everything else, the victim is only created by what I like to refer to as ignorance arbitrage. Ignorance arbitrage. Ignorance arbitrage starts when I give you a piece of currency in exchange for not having to ever deal with you again. Isn't that nice? I walk up to the checkout, buy my coffee, give you two euros, I never have to have res any responsibility for that relationship anymore. Because I'm done. Why? Because currency took care of it for me. Go screw yourself. I'm done. Next time you give somebody a piece of currency, I want you in your head or out loud to say, here's my euro, go screw yourself. Because that is what you're saying. You've been told currency is an efficiency. Oh, come on. What currency really is, is a surrogate for not having to build community and trust. That's what currency really is. It says, guess what? I don't have to remember my account with you because you don't exist. I just neutralized you with this piece of paper. You don't exist. See, you laugh kind of, but in, in a really kind of perverse way, you shouldn't be laughing because it's really sick. Because you're trying to solve a problem, but you're not solving a problem because the problem is an illusion of your own creation. Accountability and transparency, politics, economics, technology, all of those are artifacts that stand between you and realizing that you are the actor. You're the one that decided currency was an efficiency because somewhere somebody told you that that was the way you do it. And then somebody else told you, fear for your future. So put some money away. Fear for your future. Put some money away. By the way, my pocket is open. Put your money in my pocket. 
Trust me. Trust me. Really? How many of you have a personal relationship with the manager of your pension? Personal. Like you would actually leave your child when you went out to dinner. You'd actually leave your child with your pension fund manager. How many of you would do that? By show of hands. How many of you would actually go, hey, I'm going to leave my pension fund and my child with you? You laugh because that sounds like madness for most of us. There are two people who actually know enough about their own money to actually know where they'd leave them. The majority of you would go, that's madness. I don't even know who the person is. I couldn't even find him. No kidding. Guess what? Remember that fear you had? Be fearful, be fearful, be fearful for your future. Trust me, trust me, I'll hold your future. Remember that? You're all fine with that. Except two of you. Two of you actually have the audacity to actually know who's actually controlling what's supposed to be, allegedly, yours. Fascinating. Fascinating. How many of you actually take a moment when you actually think about the currency that you actually use every day, how many of you actually think about the fact that when you engage that currency, there are 20,000 dead bougainvillians who actually are on the back of whatever electronic device you used to swipe your credit card, to type your email, to write your private placement memorandum. How many of you actually recognize that? And by the way, this is not a guilt trip. The only way we can actually redeem the lives of those 20,000 people is to remember them. Did you hear what I just said? The only way we can redeem those lives is to remember them and not to let their silent deaths stay silent. The only way you can redeem these things is not to actually say, well, forget it, I'm out of copper. Lithium mines, South America, look into it. Oh, but it's a hybrid car. Bullshit. Oh, but I'm using wind turbines. Good. Go look at the great balsa clear-cut forests all over the Pacific and tell me how you feel about your wind generation green energy bullshit programs. Come on. Go look at it. PNG balsa makes all the inside blades for all these wonderful turbines so that people in Europe and people in America can feel good about green energy by clear-cutting forests. Because that makes sense. People, if we actually care, not if we, not if we care about our pet projects, but if we actually care, we'll actually stop pretending like we can solve a problem that is an illusion of our creation by creating an illusion of someone else's problem. It doesn't work that way. That great presentation we saw earlier with all the arrows up and down, earth and yin and yang and all those kinds of things, guess what? Every single wind turbine that you've seen dot every single landscape has a rainforest tree inside of it. Love that. Go green. God, I feel good. Uh, actually, I don't. How do we break through? We break through by a very simple principle of physics. And that is what we refer to as phase and state coherence. Phase and state coherence. If you really want to break through a paradigm, what you do is you start by looking at all the things you use to disintermediate what would be the right thing to do. So let's take for example, if I actually decided I don't like currency, so I want to disintermediate currency. The first thing I would do is pick a transaction. It doesn't have to be every transaction, but pick a transaction where I refuse to actually transact with currency. Now, I eat my own dog food, so I'll tell you how I do that. A third of all of our corporate activities, a third of all of our corporate activities have to be explicitly compensated with no monetary exchange. Do you hear what I just said? I'm the chairman of a company that operates in 146 countries. A third of all of our transactions have to be denominated in a non-currency value exchange. It can come in the form of commodity, custom and culture, knowledge, technology, well-being, but it cannot come in the form of money. How many of your business plans for free energy have actually thought that through? 
where you explicitly say, I'm going to be compensated in any combination of those five non-monetary value exchange units. We call it integral accounting. Integral accounting actually says you actually have to live in the world that you want to live in. If you want to live in the world, then actually start living in that world. Rather than pretending like you one day might want to be there, actually wake up tomorrow and start living there. Build one relationship on integral accounting. Build one relationship where the sole value is your ability to actually trade culture for culture, knowledge for knowledge, commodity for commodity. Do something like that. Try that. See how that works. And then do something else. Actually map the transactions that you're involved in and ask yourself how many times did you say the following? I would have got that done had I got it funded. Has anybody in the room, we talked about transparency. Catherine Austin Fitz told us that transparency would be a good thing. So let's be transparent. How many of us have ever said I would have but for the money? I would have done anything. I would have taken the trip. I would have taken more time with my family. I would have done the business, I would have started the company. If you don't raise your hand, I know you are actually not listening because I know that somewhere every person in this room has said at some point, I would have X, but for the money. And then I want you to go back and say, reclaim that moment. Just start doing. Start doing. Don't give yourself the out. Because you know what money is at the impulse of creativity? It is, in fact, what's called a phase state dissonance. It gives you the opportunity to actually subjugate your creativity for an excuse not to perform and not to act. Hell of a transaction. I can always blame it. It always shows up for me. Phase state dissonance stands between humanity and its future at every juncture. And until we resolve phase state dissonance, we won't move forward. Because we actually have to find somewhere inside of ourselves the ability to say, I have the impulse to act, therefore I act. Because the amazing thing is that the impulse that you had to act was entrusted to you in the moment where you actually had something standing right next to you that you could use for the first step. And had you had the decency to use that first thing, the cosmos would have actually given you the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. But no, what we do is we go, no, 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 I wanted it in money. Don't, you're my friend, just hang up, I'm looking for money. No, spare office space, no, I'm looking for money. Uh, no, extra computing capacity, no, I'm looking for money. Guess what? Money goes, not going to show up. Why? Because you had all the other dimensions of value and you didn't honor them. Guess what you're not going to honor? Hello? Law of the universe here. Calling. Oh, no, I'm looking for money. What we're looking for is phase state coherence. As much as possible, what you want to do is say that if you need space, configure space. If you need utilities, configure utilities. If you need commodities, configure commodities. Don't look to the funding first. Look to the thing you need first. Don't let the absence of money disintermediate you from the ability to actually access the resources that you have. And lo and behold, you will be amazed at how many resources actually don't even live with money. Like legitimately, don't hang out where money hangs out. I get to say this. And I get to say this because for now 22 years, I have run global corporations on these principles. And the reason why I actually jump on a plane from a board meeting in Salt Lake City to show up at this conference is because I still have the choice to choose every day. I still have that choice. And I don't have a shareholder somewhere that says you can't do that. I don't have a board that says you can't do that. You know why? Because I've chosen to live. It's an amazing thing when you choose to live. What falls out of that is actually the next. Break the illusion 
of a utilitarian singularity. What does that mean? What that means is everything that you do in your life, everything that you go to create, is not necessarily going to fit in the paradigm that you came up with the idea in. As a matter of fact, if you're really doing things of consequence, it probably won't fit. Did you hear what I just said? You should hear conformity is really not part of transformation. Now, that sounds simple, but how many of you have tried to change the world the same way? That's kind of a joke, right? A lot of us have tried to change the world the same way. And it turns out we try to change the world the same way and we get the same result. It's amazing. We repeat the same experiment over and over and over and over and over again and we keep getting the same result and we still pretend like it's this time, it's our lucky time. No, it's not. We need to move away from utilitarian singularity and come to a place which is kind of the giant so what, which is we need to reintegrate ourselves to productivity-linked engagement. Now, what does that mean? Productivity-linked engagement is actually an old principle of finance, and I hope that I don't offend anyone in the room, but the only people that have gotten it right, and not all of them have gotten it right, but at least a lot of them gotten it right, is people who are very astute in Islamic finance. There's a principle in Islamic finance called risk sharing. Now, the problem with that term is that that's actually not what the Arabic actually is. It's not risk sharing. It's actually experience sharing. Because the cool thing about risk sharing and halal financing is actually you ride the ups and the downs together. It's not just down exposure that you share. It's up exposure that you share. But you live in a world where both of those things are possible. Productivity-linked enterprises actually understand that sometimes things go bad, sometimes things go well. They live in a natural cycle. And that cycle is one that oscillates. So at any point in time, I'm not working with a fixed return. I'm working with a return. That return can come from a bivariate distribution. Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. Guess what happens? If I align the intentions of two people, I actually skew more ups. And I bring more people with aligned intention, and guess what I do? I skew more ups. You know what principle we use when we structure tier one capital for the largest banks in the world right now? We actually take the productivity assets that are held in liens that banks don't even know they have, and we relink those things to the underlying credit. You know what happens? We actually make performance get better. By the way, this is real energy transformation. Real energy transformation. I love to point out that you can actually do it anywhere. You can do it with the most backward, forward looking, sideways looking, anything else. By linking productivity, something you know people are going to engage, with an ability for you to participate in that engagement, value is created, which leads me to the punchline. Adam Smith is wrong. Adam Smith came up with a lie to support colonialism aided by the Anglican Church. And he was wrong. Wealth is not my ability to force my will on commodity extractions in colonial lands to enrich a few people back at home. That, by the way, if you haven't read Wealth of Nations, that's all you need to read, because that's pretty much what the whole thing is. Oh, and indentured labor and all that kind of fun stuff. If you really want to get in the weeds, you can read about the efficiencies of slavery and indentured service and all that kind of stuff. But for those of us who like to live a bit more enlightened lives, basically I just gave you a time saver because you now don't have to read all of his mindless drivel about the wealth of nations. Wealth, however, I would submit to you, is actually needing to be redefined. And if you redefine wealth, you will actually redefine energy, and if you redefine energy, you will redefine economies. And if you redefine economies, the current political charade will fall. And it actually is falling because of the formula that I have on the screen behind me. Wealth equals utility times retained optionality to the factor of all users in all value dimensions. I'm going to end with a word picture. Let's say that I have a child. I have two. I have a daughter who's 23 and a son who's 19. Let's say they were six and three. Let's say I decided that I wanted to build a playground 
in the back of my yard. So what I would do is I would go, I have about 13 acres of woodland around my property. So I would go and I'd find a couple trees and I would cut them down with a chainsaw. By the way, that would be a commodity of a tree times the inefficiency of the technology of a chainsaw times the inefficiency of the commodity of gas. Oh, hold on a second, I was accounting for my behavior there. And then I would chop it down and shape it into a form and I would make it into boards and I might treat those boards with a toxic chemical that poisons the earth like creosote or something like that, which um, would be knowledge, technology, chemistry is kind of a commodity, kind of a knowledge thing. Oh, there I get uh, accounting again. Don't want to do that. Right, and then I would actually go and build this beautiful playground with, with this vine-like thing that comes down and they can swing on made of nylon. I would watch them play the first day and realize that there isn't enough shade, so I'd go out and buy a tarpaulin that would stretch across the top so that they could actually play in the shade because I cut down the tree that actually was shade. What? I... Hold on a second. What if I would have let the tree stay a tree? What if I would have actually learned how to use the tree as a collaborator for play with my children? What if I had done that? What if they would have had the coolest tree play space that included maybe a rope from the vines that come off the tree naturally? Maybe I'd put a little board there because a limb had fallen. Maybe I'd put some laddering around it because I had branches that had fallen in the storm. Maybe I would do some things to actually make it a plaything. but what if the tree stayed a tree? And let's see, a tree after all, what is a tree? Well, a tree is a commodity because I cut it into boards. No, it isn't because last time I checked, tree is a technology that knows how to do photosynthesis, a badass function that no human being has ever replicated, and technology. What else does it do? It's a well-being thing. Creates an environment where I get peace. Creates an environment where actually it nurtures and provides hospitality for birds and animals and all kinds of other things. So there's a well-being function to tree. What is tree? Is tree knowledge? Yeah, tree is knowledge because it turns out that trees are a phenomenal record of what's actually happened in the environment. And it turns out that if you look at a tree, you can understand weather patterns, climactic patterns. You can understand all kinds of things from a tree because a tree holds knowledge and it holds better knowledge and more reliable knowledge than CNN will ever pump into your brains or BBC will ever pump into your brains. A tree knows more. It's a gathering place for communities, custom and culture. How do we feel about my swing set? How do we feel about my swing set? What we realize is that when I actually take a retained optionality away from anything, all of us get poorer. Did you hear what I just said? All of us get poorer. Wealth is your ability to be a steward of all optionality. And guess what? It doesn't live in your bank account. It doesn't live in the size of your house. It doesn't live in your inefficient refrigerator that's running at a minus 188.6 inefficiency to keep your soda cans cold or your water cold or your tofu cold if you're kind of in the vegan thing. No. Doesn't live there. It lives in your ability to actually stop believing in a world of free and realize that we are all inextricably wealthy. We are all wealthy. I am most wealthy in this very moment for the privilege of being here. Because one thing that you don't get to hear very often is a guy who one minute will be on this stage and next week we'll be talking to the Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Treasury. And then maybe on a congressional hearing on Wednesday or Thursday. And then we'll be talking to the capital markets folks in New York on Friday. Because you know what? The speech you hear today is the same speech they hear. And guess what? They listen.
That's the tragedy. The real tragedy of free energy is we picked the wrong fight. Let your energy be really expensive. Not necessarily denominated in money. How about being really expensive in honor? Honor the thousands of people who have come before who have tried to achieve the same objectives. Honor the lives of the people who have had harassments, who have had violence directed against them. All of those things. Why do we want that to be free? Why don't we want the cost of energy to actually bear the human cost? Why not? I want our energy to be so expensive in honor, so expensive in integrity, so expensive in accountability that we'll actually think before we plug the damn device into the wall and pretend like nothing ever happened. I want us to think before we consume. And then real wealth gets created. And ladies and gentlemen, with that, I want to honor you for the following. This is not what you paid to hear. But since I don't honor the money that you paid, I don't care. Because my accountability was to show up. Not to give you your money's worth, but to give you your intellect's worth. And give you your spirit's worth. And give us your heart's worth. And most importantly, I've made a solemn promise to a warlord in Bougainville in May of 2012 that said everywhere I have a chance to actually let him see him giving me the gift of life, I would honor that promise. So you gave me another opportunity to honor an old promise. And guess what? That's going to make all the difference. Thank you very much.